how these international challenges um, are unfolding and how we can address them. As the decades followed, I point out for you in the 1980s, one particular moment in time was a World Commission uh, on Environment and Development report that came out that really tried to define sustainable sustainability and sustainable development with the definition I provide for you. And there are so many ways in which um, I ask my students and people with whom I work to unpack and critique this large statement. But this one is really one that has been powerful and has been influential over the decades that have followed. In those following decades, there have been a set of goals that have been established through the United Nations framework. And so I provide for you just the basic 17 here. And within each of them, there are many sub goals that have been developed. There are many ways and metrics to determine if we are successfully trending in the right direction. Say for instance, towards goal number one of no poverty. Uh, and these are intersectional sets of challenges within which sits, as you can see, number 13, climate action. And one of the arguments that I make and is becoming more common is that we can't just consider climate action number 13 among the rest of these. That our work on climate action is embedded and in, involves work throughout all of these other challenges. There's more that I can say and I'm happy to talk about it later as well. But if we just look then at, um, I might just see if I can hide the floating video panel, oops. Hide the meeting controls. That's what I want to do so that you can see the whole thing. Um, and so there are, when we talk about these climate negotiations, we talk about politics, which is really the process through which we get these artifacts called policies. And when we're talking about climate negotiations, I just highlight three particular challenges here, um, if I can. Um, and so these include. Number one, the fact that everything counts. Activities in our world all have various climate impacts. They involve our transportation, how we get around, our land use practices, which I can say more about, industrial processes to produce consumer goods, to provide power, uh, and the way in which we use energy in our households. Basically, how we live, work, play, and relax in this world. Secondly, one of the challenges of these negotiations include the fact that this impacts people and communities differently. I'll get to in a moment several of the cruel realities that we face here, but basically there are those high emitting countries, historically high emitting countries uh, that, don't, that often don't match on to those countries that bear the burden that are at the forefront of climate impacts. This has been noted in 1995, actually in the first conference of parties meetings, we're at number 26. Uh, and there, was, there wasn't one last year because of the coronavirus pandemic. But in the very first one, there was an acknowledgement of this notion of common but differentiated responsibilities that's flowed through these discussions that have taken place. And third, among many challenges, of course, are asking questions of the institutions that are involved and how we're prepared to address it matters. How our institutions, how our organizations, how our countries can deal with these transboundary challenges really matters. And so the organizations and the configurations of, of say the different offices within our country in the United States where I sit have, has a bearing on the ability of being able to address capably uh, these kinds of challenges like climate change. So I'm just gonna fast forward for you to Paris. Uh, this was a big moment in time as many of you have possibly picked up on through work that you've done and, and schoolwork that uh, conversations that you've had in your classroom. And really just some of the main points that came out of Paris were the following. There was this goal of two degrees, not to cross a two degrees Celsius uh, threshold and encouraging 1.5 degrees Celsius. This has actually progressed to now the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. In other words, when we talk about it in Fahrenheit, this is 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Today, we are already at 1.1 degrees Celsius past the, the baseline here being uh, the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s, 1776, with the patenting of the steam engine. Second, this idea of, of introducing 
nationally determined contributions. This has been referred to more colloquially now as NDCs by all parties, and then calling on contributions from all countries. The pre previous uh, Kyoto Protocol really focused in on uh, um, 35 countries of the global north, and that was seen to be a challenging way to configure an international set of agreements. And so this was an, uh, a response to that. Happy to talk about all this more too. Just want to say that as of today, uh, the Paris Agreement is in effect, that there have been 197 signatories to the Paris Agreement. The United States represents, people say within 16 to 18% of greenhouse gas emissions. This entered into force November 4th, 2016. The NDCs that I talked about are those uh, that, are, that are put forward by countries um, in terms of talking about how they're going to meet their own goals. And so this comes from a, a great website called Carbon Tracker, where we can see the status of them that 116 countries have submitted their NDC targets. More are coming in all the time. Uh, there actually was by Patricia Espinosa an announcement that this had gone up another 50 countries during these climate talks this past first week have been coming in as part of this uh, process of moving forward to address climate change. And so this brings us to where we are right now in Glasgow. There are so many things going on. I'm really excited to hear from Gina about her perspective about what's going on. But I would just wanna focus in on four big objectives that are sought uh, to address here. I mentioned the first one coming from Paris before, really delivering on plans to keep temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and again, mentioning that we have already achieved 1.1 degrees Celsius. So you can think about that urgency uh, to avoid further um, uh, heating of the atmosphere. And second, following through on commitments that trace back, I didn't really mention Copenhagen, a set of talks in 2009, to provide green recovery and finance packages for countries of the global south. You may have heard of terms like loss and damage, adaptation, there's even some discussions around climate reparations. And this comes out again, as I mentioned before, about common but differentiated responsibilities from that very first set of talks that were in Berlin or the first conference of parties meeting to the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Third, addressing a really key article within the Paris Agreement, Article 6 on market mechanisms and carbon markets. This is a discussion around uh, what some people talk about is in terms of the economics of how to then uh, leverage money from polluters so that polluters pay and then be able to use that elsewhere to address impacts and to help communities adapt to a changing climate. So this is a very big part of that process. And then again, updating and moving forward with these nationally determined contributions is really important. So as I, as I'll come back to that slide just to finish in a minute, but as I talk about, we have this, our common future that was articulated in 1987 through that report and that definition of sustainable development that I mentioned to you, and we have choices of our energy choices and we're, we are committed to certain paths because frankly, carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere today stays in the atmosphere for 50 to 200 years. So it's critically important for us to understand that the commitments that we're making today reverberate through generations to come. There's many challenges regarding accountability as well. And I mentioned one before that that the worst effects are often not felt by those perpetrating the problem in the near long term. In other words, those with the most to lose often have the least voice, and that uh, in these patterns of causation and irresponsibility that get contested, those that are at the forefront of climate impacts are often those who haven't really contributed to the challenge. And so with that then comes governance mechanisms to deal with the problem that often are weak in the international arena, under-resourced and operate across poorly coordinated scales. So in other words, penalties for violating one's commitment through these nationally determined contributions or enforcement of them currently is weak. And that's a challenge that we face. And so as I wrap things up, you know, there is um, oftentimes some important work and discussions to be done to talk about who are the heavy polluters, 
But at the end of the day, we are all responsible. So this comes out of a, uh, a newspaper, The Onion. Many of you may be familiar with it. It's sort of a comedy newspaper, actually from my hometown in Madison, Wisconsin. But you can see that we can't just name and shame and blame others. This is actually on all of us. And so that's seen to be in some ways, I choose it to be good news. And that while we can't afford hopelessness, as Barack Obama had said in his speech in Glasgow yes, yesterday, we can look to this as a way that all of us have a role to play in an improved and changing future. And so when I return to these four big objectives, I'm certainly happy to talk uh, in more detail about each of them and break them down for you, maybe in the question and answer. But I hope that that at least provides um, a good setup for us and takes up some of my time as I uh, just hopefully set the stage and pass it along. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Max. That was really a very good, distinct overview. <laughs> you want to say anything, Daniela? Yes. Thank you so much, Max. That was great um, and a wonderful overview. Um, we're going to hear now from Gina uh, Fiorile, who is our Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Network, also known as CLEAN. She's the program specialist coordinator and a climate change communicator for series education and outreach. Gina is joining us from Glasgow, Scotland, where she has been attending COP26 with the U.S. Action for Climate Empowerment delegation. Um, and she's been covering climate education, youth action, and engagement. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about how young people can play a role in COP and what's inspiring her most while she's out there. Thanks for joining us, Gina. Yeah, let me just get this presenting. Yeah, so um, as Max mentioned, the conference is um, supposed to be ending this Friday, but in total, if it if it ends this Friday, it'll be two weeks. So I've been here in Glasgow since last Monday. Um, and it's been really busy. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people here um, from, from all over the world. Basically every nation in the world is represented here. So um, we're in Scotland and um, Glasgow is um, smaller than Philadelphia. Um, so it's, you know, it's a big city, but not too big of a city. And um, it's really, it's really taken over the city of Glasgow and it's been um, pretty, pretty crazy to see. Um, so I just wanted to hit some terms really quickly. Um, there's a lot of jargon with, um, with these climate change conferences, um, especially, I know we have some younger, younger listeners here. So, um, you know, if you don't know, the UN is the United Nations. They're an international body that works on um, uh, all different types of um, social justice issues from poverty and world hunger to climate change, environmental issues. Um, and then so you'll, you'll hear the term, the acronym UNFCCC, and that's the body of the UN that is specifically focused on climate change the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And they are the people who run this, um, this conference every year. Um, and if you don't know too, um, COP, uh, this COP26 conference is actually an acronym for Conference of the Parties. Parties are each of the participating countries. Um, they refer to them as parties. Um, so this being COP26, um, it's, the 26, it's the 26th conference um, of this type. Um, so I just wanted to give a little overview of, of the different spaces that, that exist at COPS. Um, so there's a few different areas where people go. Um, the most protected and most heavily, um, the hardest space to get into is the negotiation space where the world leaders um, actually meet. So all the heads of state, that means the, all the presidents, prime ministers, um, all those types of people for for the countries were here last week. They come for a few days and then they have people appointed from the government that do the negotiations for them. Um, so that's that's the negotiation space. And it's really, really hard to get in there. Um, that's 
mostly only for official uh, party delegates. So those people that are appointed by the heads of state um, and an extremely limited number of um, the public are allowed into that. You have to have um, accreditation. So um, in order to be at this conference, you have to have uh, you have to be accredited and have a, an official badge. Um, so you have to apply through a system on the UN um, and that brings us to the blue zone. Um, so the blue zone, you also need a badge to get in the blue zone. It's for um, all of those official party delegates, um, but then there's also availability for some NGOs, some non-governmental organizations, some corporations and the media to also be in there. Um, each country can, if they would like to pay to have a pavilion, which is basically um, like a, their own little event center in the blue zone. So each country basically has um, a, um, like a mini auditorium. There's a stage and some seating and some um, signage and information about what the country is doing. And each country has their own kind of event space that they work with. So every day there are talks, panels, um, somebody's giving a speech there every single day, pretty much every hour. <laughs> so the blue zone is very busy and you do need a badge to get in there, but there's also media allowed in that space um, and some, some non-governmental people um, are allowed in that space. Even bigger than that, this is like an onion, even bigger than that is the green zone. Um, you don't need a badge to get into the green zone. So that's a public space that the UNF Triple C um, does kind of manage, but it's not um, intended for. Well, um, people from while the delegates from countries can go in there, it's more so intended for the public um, and more of those NGOs um, who have more more events happening there, um, and the media can go there, um, and different companies can go there as well, and then. On top of that, you have public spaces all around the city that are filled with all different types of events. Um, you have public awareness events. The delegation that I'm with did a workshop at the University of Glasgow yesterday for some students. Um, there are protests and demonstrations happening all around the city. There are some art installations talking about climate change um, that you'll just happen upon and some cop signage over the city. Um, and yeah, just like reporters and uh, media walking around constantly. So there's this, the COP setup is um, it's kind of like an onion. There's layers to it. And um, the further in you want to go, the harder it is to get access. Um, but even around the city, there, there's stuff happening. Um, so this is the delegation that I'm a part of. Um, I'll just mention it really briefly. It's called the U.S. Ace Coalition. Um, so this is this is an NGO. Um, it's a coalition or a group of multiple different um, organizations who are focused on all these different um, all these different areas of focus. So um, education, training, public awareness, all those things. My, you know, I'm I'm representing Clean while I'm at the conference, so I'm more focused on the education, but this coalition is basically trying to bring um, all different types of organizations together, kind of no matter what their, um, what their, <laughs> what their goal is, they just want to bring people together uh, to work on climate change. Um, and it, it's interesting because it's actually an official working group within the UN. Um, is the US ACE is what it's called, Action for Climate Empowerment. Um, and they were working this year at COP26 this year to um, kind of reassess the working group. Um, it expired recently. Um, so it is, it is an official UN um, body, but um, kind of made up by, by NGOs. So it's, it's a little hard to wrap your head around, but that's, that's what I've, um, I've been attending a lot of events with this delegation here. Um, and it's been really busy and really awesome. Um, so I'm just gonna show you some pictures. Um, like I said, even, I mean, there's thousands of people all around, all around the city, but even in the event space, there are thousands of people. Um, just think, you know, you have almost 200 countries and multiple people um, from each country. So the, the event space is packed really huge. Um, 
this is the line to get in. They have really heavy security. It's like going through the airport every morning. Sometimes you have to wait in line for an hour just to get in. Um, so you have to dress warm and plan ahead. <laughs> um, so yeah, they make you go through metal detectors and scan your badge and all that stuff. Um, so it's really busy, um, but they have it decorated quite quite elaborately inside. Um, it's it's just a really huge event space. Um, the blue zone is, is where I've been going. Um, like I said, that's where all the pavilions are for the different countries. Um, and they just have meetup spaces and workspaces and stages um, so that people can kind of collaborate on all the work that they're doing. Um, these are uh, the pavilions for the country of Tuvalu and um, UAE. Um, some pavilions are more elaborate than others. This, this has, you know, Tuvalu has some fun uh, polar bears happening. Um, some are smaller than others um, and not everyone is a pavilion, but um, that's kind of what that looks like. Um, there you have pavilions dedicated to um, the sustainable development goals, so more UN work, um, just different spaces where people meet up. Um, so different, different companies can have pavilions, different countries can have pavilions. This is a, a pavilion focused on peatland, so it, it's kind of, um, you, you put your name in if you want a pavilion and um, apply for it. Um, and then they have all different types of interactive, um, interactive things that you can uh, participate in in this space. This is um, uh, a sheet asking what you know. What do you? Why are you here? What do you want to see happen? Um, this is an art an art installation in the space um, hanging from the ceiling. Um, and then, so those are all pictures of the blue zone. The green zone that that's the um, public space this year is happening at the Glasgow Science Center. Um, so they have a few exhibits happening around climate change right now. Um, and that that's the public space. So this is um, some of my team members walking through the space. Um, more um, kind of exhibitions and things to look at and to walk around, welcome sign. Um, and then this is a picture of the protest that happened um, kind of in the city center over the weekend. Um, so there was a protest, a really, really big protest that happened on Saturday and one for you specifically on Friday. Um, the one on Saturday, there are people from literally everywhere that came in, it was massive and it completely took over the city. It shut down tons and tons of streets, um, but it's, it's people who um, want the world leaders to take, to take notice that, that people are watching them. Um, so yeah, there's just signs all over the city um, and protests and people just, People are people want the world leaders to pay attention, um, and youth are not um, not exempt from that. Youth are really super involved in COP26. Um, like I said, there is a, a really big protest on Friday. It was part of the Fridays for the Future climate strike. Um, youth, there was um, each day at COP. There's a theme, and Friday was the youth day, so there was a lot of. Um, there was a lot of panels and speakers on Friday that were talking about um, young people's involvement in climate change. Um, and then there's also um, an entire conference leading up to COP called the Conference of Youth that our part, a part of our delegation attended um, that talks about, you know, how youth are involved, how youth are involved in climate change and what they want the UN, what they want to see the UN do. Um, and that is coordinated by um, a part of the UN called YOUNGO, which is another acronym. And it's just, it's the youth constituency for the UN. Um, and they're a really cool group that I will talk about a little bit later, but they they basically coordinate all of the, the, youth, the youth stuff at COP. Um, so uh, it's really awesome that you all are here. And I bet you're wondering like, this is really cool, but you know, what does this have to do with me? Well, there's a lot that you can do. And I know some of the questions that were asked um, ahead of time were, um, we're looking at this. So there's a few different things that you can do. Um, so you can sign the ACE National Strategy Framework for the US. That's uh, the ACE Coalition is what I was talking about. This is like signing a petition or saying, 
hey, I really want to see um, climate empowerment in the future. Um, so you can uh, sign this framework. Um, you can join Youngo, that organization that I was just talking about. Um, you can visit the website, um, kind of sign up for different alerts from them, um, check out all of their resources and become involved with them. There are a few different competitions that this organization called Connect for Climate is running um, for youth to either do video contests or art contests. Um, and they have quite a few listed on their website. Um, you can watch more um, dialogues on the USA framework. Um, and that is um, also a link is provided. So um, all of these resources that I just kind of blew through, they are actually, they're on the, um, the site for this, uh, for this webinar. So the, where you went to sign up for this webinar, there's um, a section of the website that has links to all these resources. So if you're really interested in any of them, you can go ahead and check those out. Um, and it's 5.33. Um, so any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much, Gina. Yeah, we would love to hear some questions. We have about 10, a little over 10 minutes for questions. Um, there is a question that was submitted ahead of time that, um, that you touched on a little bit, but I'm wondering if, um, if, if you have any other suggestions on what, what are some of the most effective actions that um, teens or youth can do to promote climate awareness and or positive change? Yeah, I think it's important to <clears throat> start by having a conversation in your, uh, with your parents, in your school, with your teachers. Um, I'll go back to, um, this is one thing that I want to talk about, but ran out of time, so I'll cover it. <laughs> uh, I'll cover it right now. Um, so this is a program that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'll put the link on the website as well, and I'll put it in the chat, but this is an organization that provides students with opportunities to create climate action plans for their schools and communities. You first go to an event called Youth Climate Summit, um, and then you, um, you create a climate action plan based on all of the information that you've learned. Um, so I'll put the information in the chat again, but Basically, if you're really inspired by something, um, say you want to put a refill, a water bottle refill station in your school, you want to start a recycling program, you want to start composting, um, you want your um, town leaders to focus more on climate change and you want to come speak at one of their events, um, you can do that with some of the resources that this organization provides. Um, they're also part of the US AIDS Coalition and I think they're one of the best organizations that kind of helps young people um, do, do what they need to do in their community. So I would recommend checking out this website. Um, there's a, like so many different things that you can do, but it's really assessing what, what your school or what your community needs first, and then trying to figure out a plan of how to get there. That's awesome, Gina. Uh, Mr. Gundel from Seattle, Washington shared with us that they are creating their own climate action plans in their classroom. Um, that's a high school class. So awesome. We love hearing that. Um, okay, next question we have is, and this can be for, I think this one's more for Gina, but would be really for both. What are your top three takeaways from COP26, especially in terms of what surprised you the most? Um, I think right now we have a problem with listening. <laughs> um, world leaders are not doing a really great job of listening to the people. As Max mentioned, um, there are a lot of people who are not contributing to climate change that are getting really impacted by it. Um, and I think that young people in the future can do a lot better job of listening to whatever, whatever role they're in, if they're serving people. Um, I think one takeaway is that we need to listen to each other um, rather than just kind of like 
I don't know, serving yourself first. Um, there's a lot more that I could say about that, but that's kind of how I'm going to frame it for this discussion. Um, so that's a takeaway. Listen. Um, I would say also like rely on the community around you and just don't be afraid to have those sometimes difficult conversations and also um, find something in this space that really inspires you. You know, if, if you're really passionate about food or, or agriculture or something, just go with that. You know, um, it, it can be tiring working in the space after a while. So find something that you're really passionate about and just, and just run with it. I think that's well put. Um, I totally agree with you in terms of listening and, and um, just to think about this generationally too, with so many of you in school who are joining us right now with your teachers, that encouraging your parents, encouraging adults generally to listen to you, I think is really important. You have the most at stake. Um, you've inherited a planet where this has been a real challenge during your lifetime. And so, um, one of the, one of the way, things that I've found really uh, engaging from what you've presented, Gina, is just that there are so many pathways to find your voice nowadays. Um, and so through that, I mean, I think there are really effective ways that you can reach your parents, you can reach your grandparents, you can reach other family members, your neighbors, and on and on and on. And uh, one of the sad realities here in the United States that's been documented by um, researchers at Yale and George Mason universities, is it surprisingly only 35% of, of adults that they pull talk about change occasionally or even often, even, you know, so these conversations aren't taking place. And in terms of moving towards climate action plans as young people, in terms of encouraging others to listen to your perspectives, and the range of emotions from, from understandable fear and anxiety across to uh, your ambitions and your hopes and your dreams um, is really, really important. And so I, when I'm doing my work and I'm talking to other adults solely, one of the things that I really try and focus in on is, is building up stronger conversations with people, even people with whom we disagree. So I hope that's helpful in terms of building on what what Gina has just uh, proposed and, and what sounds like a few of the questions that are coming up about what can you do? I mean, it just can even start with a conversation, can start with asking for someone to listen to your perspective. Thank you, Max. That's great. Um, we have a few more minutes for questions. If anybody else has questions, please send them in the q and A. I I can also make you live if your class would like to ask a question. There's another mm -hmm. question. Oh, go ahead, Max. Oh, did you get a question, Danielle? I'm always happy to say something if you're waiting on one. This is one that came in uh, in our sign-up forms that um, I can ask. It's, um, that I think is kind of interesting and relevant to what we've been talking about. And that's um, what local concrete and collective action can young people participate in to put pressure on the adults in their communities to move away from fossil fuels. And I think you both touched on this a little bit. Definitely, do you wanna start Gina and I'll follow? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think that there's a lot that you can do. I think that inviting or asking to speak to a local representative is more impactful than anyone thinks it is. Um, you know, we want to talk to the president or talk to, um, I don't know, a world leader or something. But um, with the young people that I've worked with, they've had a lot of success talking to their their mayor um, from, you know, from a small town or um, different committees in their towns, they've had a lot of success there. Um, and that's, you can go about that a lot of ways, depending on how your town works. But I would recommend scheduling a meeting with someone locally who, um, who has, who is kind of in a position of power and talking and talking to them. Um, and I would say too, as you get older, um, 
the best way to vote is with your money usually. Um, so, you know, as you start, um, you know, high school students, if you're um, going to college soon and you're gonna start buying your own food or, um, you know, you can have a conversation with your parents about wanting to eat less meat, um, stuff like that is, is very powerful. Um, it, you know, you can, you can also vote with your money. <laughs> um, so while, you know, you guys are pretty young still, obviously, but, um, it's, it would be worth having a conversation with your parents to talk about, um, you know, how, how you eat or in the future, um, where you're, where you're putting that, I guess. So, yeah. That's great. I, I mean, building on that, I think there's so many creative ways that um, one can uh, concretely take action in their local communities. Um, and when I think about creativity, that can be through um, the way in which you're reaching directly out to your elected officials, as Gene is suggesting. It can be, if you have a local newspaper, to be starting to write letters to the editor that then uh, people end up reading quite a lot. It can be calling into your local radio station if you have one and, and leaving a voicemail on their comment line that they may air once a week, starting to find your voice that way. It can be uh, by building on Fridays for the future. Why limit it to Fridays? Uh, it can be taking actions, um, you know, maybe flash mobs and dance parties that help celebrate the power of young people that can come together and find their collective voice to call for more urgent climate action. And so this, this is just the start. Um, and as you get older, as Gina's saying, you know, and as you start to control your own money, there's lots of ways to get involved. As you reach a voting age, there are uh, many other ways to get involved. And as you reach these arbitrarily established thresholds of eligibility to run for offices, encouraging you to change the very system um, because the question is great about what local concrete collective actions can we take. And I think embedded in the success of those actions is a sustained effort and that it takes that kind of sustained engagement over time to make the changes significant enough that are needed at this point. Max, thank you so much. Max and Gina, thanks for joining us today. That was, that was a great answer. And I hope that everyone is feeling inspired and a little bit more informed about what COP26 is. We are out of time this morning, um, but I am available via email to answer questions and we'll be following up with all of our participants. So please feel free to email me and send questions our way. Um, we will do our best to answer those and get back to you. Um, we really appreciate your time this morning and Gina, I hope you have a, a great time the rest of your week out in Glasgow um, being part of the action. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening and thanks um, to my fellow series folks for putting it on. Thanks, Daniela. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, Beck and Katie and others in the series that made this possible. And, and I appreciate everyone's interest and engagement. We need everyone. Thanks again, Max. Bye, everybody.